Catholic universities are born from the very heart of the church with a mission focused upon complete human formation and the renewal of culture. The University of Dallas is so proud to be part of this grand tradition of Catholic university education. We take to heart our charge to help our students learn how to live lives of deep meaning and purpose. They leave the University of Dallas thinking clearly, writing eloquently, speaking persuasively, and adding to the great treasury of human knowledge. This series, The Quest, is born from this same mission. Our guideposts are the true, the good, and the beautiful. And you'll be invited to reflect upon the beautiful in a particular way in this series. Consider it our gift to you. I'm so grateful to the many volunteers who've made this possible, especially our amazing faculty whom you'll meet in this series, our tremendous staff, our talented videographers, and especially I'm grateful to Dr. Shannon Valenzuela, whom you'll meet very soon. Finally, I want to thank you for joining us on this, our quest. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our special live stream launch event of The Quest, The Way of Beauty. We are so excited that you've joined us this evening. I'm so excited to be here with two very dear friends of mine and colleagues and collaborators on this project. Stefan Novinsky, who is my assistant director, and Father John Byer, who is our script consultant. And we're just, we're just thrilled to be here with you all tonight and to talk about this project. So our plan tonight is we're going to watch the episode together. We're going to watch episode six, and then we're going to have a nice conversation afterwards. We would love to welcome your questions. If you do have questions or comments during the streaming of the episode, please go to quest.udallas.edu slash live stream, and you can leave your question there. And we will be taking some time at the end of tonight's event to answer some of your questions. So again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us. And let's go ahead and dive into episode six. Have you ever experienced that moment? Maybe sitting at the dining room table with your family or sitting in the pew at church when you realize that you're completely and utterly burned out. You stepped out onto your path in faith and with courage, but sometime you don't even exactly remember when that fire burned down to embers and maybe now it's threatening to go out altogether. There's something missing and you're left asking God, where are you? Where can I find you? When people want to know where can I meet God, usually they mean something more experiential. They're wanting to know in a subjective sense, how can I experience his presence? You know, we believe his presence in the sacraments. We believe there were two or three gathered in my name. There am I in, in their midst. But we want to know how to feel him. This is what we want most, to feel the strong and sure presence of God in our lives, to feel fully, joyfully, abundantly alive in his love. Think back to moments when you felt filled to the brim and overflowing. Maybe it was in a symphony hall and the notes pulled you out of yourself and into a place of timelessness where memory and the present moment and the infinite possibilities of the future are held together in perfect suspension. Or maybe it was stepping into a church for the first time in a long time, the breathless looking up into the vault that reminds you at once how very small you are and yet how infinitely precious and passionately loved. The Way of Beauty is the atlas of the heart of God, whose pages invite us to discover him in so many marvelous and mysterious ways. It's a treasure hunt, and the clues are all around us, in the natural world, in art, in stories, in history, in the sacraments, the scriptures, and the lives of the saints. The Way of Beauty invites us, as Christ himself invites us, to become like little children again, to set aside our fears, to open up our hearts, and to rush out to meet him with wonder and joy. As Dostoevsky famously said, beauty will save the world, to which we respond, he already has. In the 
church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva is the tomb of the renowned painter Fra Angelico. Born in 1395, Fra Giovanni da Fiesole earned his nickname Fra Angelico not only because of his extraordinary artistic talent, but also because of his deep holiness. Pope St. John Paul II beatified Fra Angelico in 1982 and declared him patron of artists in 1984. It's fitting that we begin our journey on the way of beauty with the patron of artists, and that we recognize, as Fra Angelico did, that the end of the way of beauty is that beauty so ancient and so new, God himself. We begin the journey with a meditation on one of Fra Angelico's favorite subjects, the Annunciation. In the Incarnation, God clothes his divine beauty in our human form, and as St. Paul says, Christ in his incarnate humanity is the image of the invisible God. An icon in Greek is simply an image. And Paul refers to Christ as the image of the invisible God in Colossians 1.15. It's a beautiful phrase because there's a paradox at the heart of that insight. How can you have an image of something that is by definition invisible? Well, God gives a face in Christ to the divinity that cannot be limited by any human shape. The mystery of Christ's incarnation gives the body a sacred nobility and makes the body an essential part of our redemption. God said, let us make humans in our image. God is a spiritual being, but we're physical beings. So there's something about being embodied creatures that's essential to the experience of our being related to each other and relating with God. The Incarnation shows us that the human body is good enough for God. It's a fitting receptacle for the Divine Presence. The Incarnation sanctifies all of the human senses insofar as Jesus saw, touched, tasted, etc. And in prayer, those tangible aids such as the Rosary or the beautiful church architecture. They can all be mile markers in a way as we go forward on the path, trying to orient us towards the God who wishes to, to meet us through the senses, through our day-to-day -day lives. He redeemed us according to the way that he made us. The logic of the sacraments is the logic of Christ. It's through what is visible that we are caught up to the, this, the love of things divine. One of the most obvious reasons that uh, an embodied spirituality is the best spirituality for human beings is because we are simply embodied spirits. We can be no other. And God's gift to us is that he reveals himself to us and ministers to us in our need through the body. When he revealed himself, he became incarnate. When he wills to operate on us as the divine physician, he does so through the sacraments. And when he wills to dwell among us until the end of the age, he does so in a mystical body infused by his very spirit, such that we can come into contact with him physically through the sacraments, through the church that he upholds. This is why beauty has the power to move us toward the good and the true, because God, in his infinite mercy and wisdom, has chosen to meet us in our daily lives through the body and the senses. But there are some who fear that it's a distraction. Lenin said uh, famously um, that he, he, he can't listen to Beethoven too much because if he does, he'll, he won't start the revolution. And I think in, in the way Lenin looks at it, it's actually kind of going back to the same criticism that was leveled to Tolkien about being escapist. This idea that, yeah, beautiful things, they, they, they're, they're beautiful and they're pleasurable, but it's what we really need to do is start a revolution and that things like this just distract us. I think there has always been this sort of sense that um, there's the true, and everybody kind of knows that's important. It's important to, to speak truthfully. I mean, your own parents tell you that, right? And it's important to be good. But I think sometimes beauty can be seen as, um, oh, that kind of extra. That's nice to have. There, there's something sort of less than necessary, I think, we sometimes think about beauty, um, which is, of course, wrong. <laughs> Humans desperately need beauty. Um, and and, it, and it, um, without beauty, I think humans tend to wither. 
But there's another objection against beauty. Some say it's not just a distraction, it's a deception. What if I follow beauty and it leads to destruction? In The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins watches in dismay as the heart of his dear friend Thorin Oakenshield is corrupted by his desire for the Arkenstone. And in The Lord of the Rings, Smeagol is a perfect example of how a desire for a beautiful object can lead to a corruption of the heart. I, I think the, 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 the biggest, clearest example of that is the ring itself. I mean, the, the, it, you know, it's simple, but it always, it always uh, affects people with this sort of uh, allure uh, to where you know Gollum calls it his precious. There is this idea that it is beautiful. It is so people can't take their eyes off it. They have to have it. This idea of, of lusting after the beauty of the ring, which is really disguised lust for power. Um, you have a, a similar thing a little bit in the Hobbit, in that the actual quest for the in the in, in the in the Hobbit is this treasure for the dragon, this idea of riches and wealth uh, that is blinding, that actually sort of blinds the dwarves from, from doing the right thing and the good thing. And, and Bilbo, uh, as we get toward the end, especially with the Arkenstone, he finally realizes none of this really matters. This is not really what this quest is about. So this this idea of, of, of beauty and, and power and glory and all of these things are very often uh, in the fig different figures in Tolkien's world uh, these things sort of represent that idea of the seductive nature of evil. Uh, Milton's Satan is quite compelling and attractive. It has these features that are imitative of that which is well-ordered, right? And, and that notion is, I think, key, right? Tolkien saw this with perfect clarity, that any, anything that's evil is a perversion of that which is good. There's always been a kind of suspicion of the beautiful in the West that it can lead you astray. Um, that, that beauty has this kind of claim on us and can often claim our emotions and can often kind of get us hopped up in ways that can be dangerous, that can, that can lead us away from the true or the good. The world says that beauty is the thing that glitters. It says that happiness is a thing you buy, that love is measured in likes, and that the only life worth living is one that yields a perfectly curated collection of picture-perfect moments. Why do these false promises attract us? Because there are deep wounds of fear in the human heart. Wounds that whisper to us that we are unlovable, that God can't be trusted, and that this life, in the end, is all for nothing. There's a deep human fear that nobody even notices that you were ever here. And it is a profound, deep fear. And it's been shared of really with young people that they are so afraid that, that they are going to come into this world and go out of this world and no one's going to even know that they were here because they were never seen or heard. If you think of the experience that a lot of people talk about of FOMO or the fear of missing out, where I try to do so many things or be in so many places or pick up so many hobbies because I don't want to miss out on anything in life. That, I think, is a really deep spiritual wound. And I think it's the same one behind, say, gluttony or lust or so many of the other deadly sins where I'm just trying to fill myself up because I sense this emptiness or this contingency. Maybe in a sense, it's ultimately a fear of death, a, a recognition of our own contingency that at one day you will expire and there's a limit. And in the face of that limit, we're just trying to gather all we can. Eve in the garden, when she grasps after that life like God on her own terms in order to fill up whatever sense of, of anxiety she was experiencing, it came because she had first lost confidence in the goodness of God. And so we, if we want the way back to peace, have to accept our finitude, accept our mortality, be willing to miss out, not to eat everything, uh, because we're confident that the one who's guiding my life, he will assure that I have everything that I truly need. And in his good love for me, he'll preserve what really matters into eternity. Uh, I like to think of walking through the woods or the mountains and seeing beautiful wildflowers, where you see something beautiful, but you know you are not meant to possess it. It is, it is, it is beautiful and you are human and blessed in recognizing it. But you must let God be God and order all the flowers of the world. And instead of picking it to possess it, put it in your back pocket, take it home, and thereby destroy it in your desire to possess it. 
You leave it there in the field, admire it, and then keep walking along the journey. One of the things that it, it always fascinates people about uh, the, the Tolkien stories is that he focuses on the hobbits. What he seems to want, want to pull out of hobbits is the special characteristics that human beings do have that make them less vulnerable to the, the glamour of evil or lusting after power or beauty or whatever it is. And that is a certain modesty, a certain humility, and a certain um, desire not for, for great things, but the desire to live in harmony and, and peace with your surroundings. These subtle virtues that the hobbits embody that, that Tolkien doesn't want us to forget and makes them these unlikely heroes. They are not these you know, knights in shining armor, but they have this, this other quality that makes them so much more resilient to, to evil and special that only they can bear the, the ring and, and eventually destroy it. On July 22, 1942, the young Jewish woman, Eddie Hillism, walked home after a long day at the Westerbork transit camp where the Jews were held until they were shipped out on the Nazi death trains. It was raining that night and she had a blister on her foot, but she still stopped at a flower stall and picked up an armful of roses. They represented Eddie's choice to hope in a beauty that never fades, rather than to despair in the darkness of her present moment. Beauty teaches us to hope even when it seems there's no reason for it, and it guides us toward the good and the true. When you think about what is the beautiful, how do you define beauty? What's the ultimate canon of the beautiful? Uh, for Balthazar and for Ratzinger, it's ultimately God's revelation of who he is. As Aquinas would say, it has integrity, it has a wholeness, it has proportion and order, and it also has this third feature, this third mark of beauty, which is he calls clarity or radiance, or sometimes we'll call it the splendor of the form, that something in it bespeaks a hidden intelligibility that draws us in. And that's why the beautiful object is attractive, because it bespeaks uh, uh, inside the thing, there's more intelligibility than it's letting us know at first sight, you might say. Um, and that's why it evokes out of us love, a desire for it, not a desire to own it, but a desire to know it. Beauty takes truth and goodness and gives it clothes gives it form, gives it something that we can recognize. Beauty gives us warmth and light. Beauty shines. There's, there's something shining forth about that which is beautiful. And so thinking of those three terms together, right, the proportionality, the integrity, and the clarity of a beautiful thing, we can unlock both the metaphysical depths on the one hand and the moral motivational qualities of beauty on the other. Beauty reminds us of the perfection that our hearts somehow remember, the perfection that waits for us on the other side of this life. The Greeks called this feeling nostalgia, a kind of fond reminiscence, like the memory of your grandmother's house at Christmas time. But I think the Welsh word hiraeth comes closer to the experience of beauty. Hiraeth is a deep homesickness, or as one definition puts it, a longing to be where your spirit lives. Writing in the 14th century, the Byzantine theologian Nicholas Cabasilas recognized that this kind of longing comes from God. When men experience a longing so deep that it surpasses human nature, he writes, it is the bridegroom himself who has sent a ray of beauty into their eyes. Beauty in general, because of the way we are made as human beings, has an ability to lift our hearts and to draw our souls to, to something beyond ourselves. Um, to want something that we don't yet have. Beauty touches us in the heart. It engages the emotions and it makes us yearn. And I think that when we yearn, we realize like what it is we're yearning for. To know true beauty, the beauty that God reveals to us, the incredible call that we have as human beings, the dignity that we have to be members, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, uh, that's something that's gonna leave us longing, leave us feeling our woundedness, and that's okay. I think that one of the most important lessons in the spiritual life is to be comfortable crying, to see the beauty of the life to which we're called, and to accept peacefully, with tears, because we want it, the ways in which we don't yet enjoy it. But in order to be in love with the beauty and to keep journeying, you have to acknowledge you're on a journey and you're not yet where you want to be. 
So cry, but cry in peace, and above all, keep walking. The Pontifical Council for Culture proclaims that true beauty opens the pathway for the search for God and disposes the heart to meet Christ, who is the beauty of holiness. The philosopher, in some ways, is the one who, whose eyes have been opened, and all of us can be philosophers in this sense, whose eyes have been opened to the wonder of being living with a conviction, you might say, of the beauty of being in every person you encounter, in every natural reality that you sense, that all of this bespeaks an incredible generosity on the part of God, ultimately, who brings these things about freely and are given to us freely to be perceived, to be known, to be loved. Each of us has a certain uh, pathway or window onto the beauty of being, and Philosophy in some ways is asking you to, to open up that window as wide as it can so as to include your encounter with every reality whatsoever in its beauty. One of my favorite uh, books to teach, the, the Confessions, because uh, he has a very interesting relationship with beauty. On the one hand, he says, it is the loveliness of created things that caused me to just plunge myself into them wholeheartedly and in, in many ways in a disordered way. But that's not where Augustine ends up. As he begins to discover the person of Christ and to fall in love with God, he now knows how to see beauty more clearly. This deeper communion that he has with God actually awakens his senses. It awakens his appreciation for genuine beauty because now he knows how to love. The painter Marc Chagall once called the scriptures an iconographic atlas. The images of salvation history are so many maps that guide us on our pilgrimage to God. The iconographic atlas of Christ's death and resurrection gives us a new definition of beauty, one which, as 19th century novelist Victor Hugo observes, recognizes that we are both made of earth and made for eternity. Hugo says in his preface to Cromwell, which is kind of his romantic manifesto, um, that on the day Christianity told human beings that they were um, flesh and spirit, that they were both uh, launched towards the divine but also rooted in, in the an their animal nature. Um, from that time on, the kind of, I'm paraphrasing him, but the kind of purity of art of the ancient world um, was no longer possible. Uh, for us as an avenue of representation. Because Christianity demands that you both recognize the call to um, the divine and recognize man's rootedness in earth and in his fleshly form. And Jesus bridges that, um, that tremendous gap. Uh, but once Jesus is there, you can't just have idealized art, which just makes the body a kind of representation of the divine just by its beauty, because Jesus came to suffer. Um, and he understands that human life involves suffering. Um, also, you can't just focus on the negative and on the bleak, because through this suffering, redemption is possible. During the holy season of Lent, the church confronts one of the most profound mysteries of our faith. Christ, the beautiful babe of Bethlehem, has become disfigured by the sufferings of Calvary. As we read in the prophet Isaiah, he had neither beauty nor majesty, nothing to attract our eyes, no grace to make us delight in him. God descends to the depths of human suffering and human agony, showing us that the way from human limitation to eternal triumph is through the cross, is through the willing acceptance of suffering and pain and incomprehension so that we can move from darkness to light, from death to life. This is God in his revelation of himself sort of relativizing our canons of beauty and showing us the true beauty. And what is the true beauty that we see in Jesus Christ? We see a love gone to the end, this readiness to endure whatever may come in obedience to God and out of love for the good of even his enemies. Christ so loved the Father that he would do everything the Father commanded. And he so loved us 
that he wants to make us good, even when we spend every ounce of energy we have to fight him as his enemy. When you look at his head with a crown of thorns, you can say in full sincerity, that is the most beautiful face, because I've never seen a greater love. I've never seen anything that could reconcile the whole world to itself. I've never seen a proportion that could make sense of every cross I've ever borne or ever seen. But that face, that unconditional love, there's nothing more beautiful. On our pilgrim way through this life, we ask in the voice of the beloved in the Song of Songs, where do I find him whom my soul loves? We want to feel what the great Spanish mystic St. John of the Cross felt as he describes how his soul ventures forth to meet the God of his heart. He goes out without light or guide, save that which burned in my heart. This light guided me more surely than the light of noonday to the place where he was awaiting me. O night that guided me, O night more lovely than the dawn, night that joined beloved to lover, lover transformed in the beloved. Join us next time on The Way of Beauty as we, like the beloved in the Song of Songs and like St. John of the Cross, begin our pilgrimage to search for God with beauty as our guide. All right, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the episode. We're so excited to now have a conversation um, about what went into making this um, and why the way of beauty, why in this cultural moment, why do we need to have this, this conversation? So maybe we could just kind of start with, with some of the fun stuff, uh, talking a little bit about what went into making this series. Um, as you saw, we got to shoot part of this episode on our campus, uh, the University of Dallas's campus in Rome, which was wonderful. Um, so maybe we can just start there and just kind of talk a little bit about the experience of, of putting this this together. So, well, let me, um, so talk a little bit, Shannon, about what your process is when you started this. Did you start with, you started with the faculty interviews? Yes. Right? Yes. And then you tie it all together miraculously? Yeah. Yeah. So when we started the, the process, uh, we started last summer and uh, we kind of came up with, with the concept that we wanted to take the themes of, of the first uh, five episodes of the quest, uh, which really kind of deal with with the human experience um, and our journey of faith and how we find the courage to kind of live and discover our purpose and, and really live it, live it with courage. And I wanted to take that a step further and kind of really, in a way, do a deeper dive on that experience of the dark night of the soul, mm. right? Where where do we go when we sort of run out of steam a little bit? You know, we we get fired up. We're ready to go out there. We're ready to live our purpose with courage. And then maybe something happens and we kind of stumble, right? We stumble on the way. Um, there may be tragedy in our life or we're, we're going through hard times. And, and that question that, that you hear me ask in the, in the very first opening moments of, of, the, of the series uh, of this episode, um, where do we find God, right? Where, where do we experience him? Um, and so I thought, you know, as a sort of next step on our journey, let's let's dive into that, and um, and I and I, I kind of wanted to do something on on beauty, on what the church has given us, uh, what God has given us to kind of work from, to find Him, to be able to experience Him. So you know, I try to think of all these different ways in which we we meet God um, in our world, in ways that that He has sort of offered himself to meet us in our in our daily lives. And concretely, how did you work with the different professors? I remember, you know, being solicited for vague sets of ideas yeah. and then each professor just shows up with his or her thoughts on a topic and you get to listen and interview and then somehow out of all of those diverse voices and instruments create something symphonic where we're all talking to each other without ever having been in the same room yeah. because of the way you're stitching things together. Yeah, it's a really, really, fun. it's probably one of my favorite parts of the process um, is coming up with sort of, I did, uh, yeah, we have 19 faculty who uh, over the course of this, these five episodes make an appearance. And so I did an initial round of interviews with everybody that, that I thought, okay, maybe they might want to be part of this um, and, and knew something about their background and, and thought, okay, they, they have something really neat to say about this. Um, so, so I did an initial round of interviews and kind of formulated a set of questions. And then, yeah, everybody got to sit for an hour interview. 
Um, and, and we just, we just hit record and, and then, yeah, the process of going back through watching all of that footage and then coming up with the shape, uh, then after that of, of what this was going to actually be. So the, the scripting, the narrative sections that, that I do, um, actually comes last. That's actually built around, as you say, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, almost, uh, the, these amazing moments that that sort of happen uh, in, in, as part of these conversations, um, and that becomes, as you said, the the stitching that that mm -hmm. uh, that kind of weaves the voices together. It's really daunting to do when you do the hour. You have these questions she gives you, and you're talking, and you're just answering them, and you'll see her eyes light up. Uh, yeah, and you'll shoot. And <laughs> oh, I she can, likes that one. Yeah, she <laughs> liked that one. Oh, I'll keep yeah. going, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I yeah. bet you've thought about something someone else yeah. said. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah. I know how this is all going to come together. Yeah. And you finish and you're like, well, is that work? And she's yeah. like, it's fine. I'll make it work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, that is why it's such a cool process because none of the 19 people that I sat in a chair had any idea what anybody else was saying, yeah. but I did. And so, as you say, yeah. I would hear somebody say something. And I'm like, oh, yes, this yeah. is going to be great because somebody else or two or three even other people have sort of given their own voice to that very same mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. And it starts to create this harmony um and it's it's the coolest thing i really have to say it's very cool to be part of and i and i think that's the the beauty of the university of dallas to be honest mm -hmm. with you i think it's because we have a collection of minds in this place and there's a resonance and a harmony even though everyone's sort of working in their own disciplines and everyone mm -hmm. kind of has their own their own field that they're really really knowledgeable about there is a greater conversation that's happening underneath all of that and it's it's the beauty of something like this really to me is that that we get to showcase that we get to actually put in front of everyone that there is that conversation i think our students know it um because they have in a way a similar experience and they walk into everyone's classes and they start to hear mm -hmm. uh they start to hear that what's going on in history is also resonating mm -hmm. in theology and in literature um and i think that's just part of what makes this education so special. Yeah, I mean, reality being integrated and the capacity of the different methods and sciences to reveal one or another aspect and through that particular aspect, accent another aspect and now they're singing together. Yeah. Uh, it is I'm one of my favorite features of the series as well to just show that symphony of, of, of disciplines. Yeah, well, we always forget, right? That we talk about truth, goodness and beauty as the transcendentals, but we always forget that unity is mm -hmm. the fourth and to me it's like that's that's the unseen um in a way the unseen glue i suppose you might say that mm -hmm. we, we don't necessarily always talk about but it's it's apparent in a way um, it's mm -hmm. kind of amazing when when i'm watching i don't know if you've had this where you're watching and then you'll finish a section and they'll cut to a colleague who says a very similar thing usually better than i said <laughs> it right and you just you you swell up with love for yeah. all your colleagues like wow look how brilliant mm. they all are yeah yeah it I, I i do feel that way it, it was it's very humbling to watch this and also very encouraging yeah. i just remember feeling like same team <laughs> and like i have so yes. much to learn yes. You know? yes, yeah. yes, yes. So it's really cool feelings yeah. yeah yeah no that that's really the hope um and and that's how i i feel too that i get to sit at the feet of all mm -hmm. of my colleagues and let them teach me what they know yeah. mm -hmm. um and and i i get the, the honor yeah. of trying to make something, you know, make it, make a, make a quilt out of all of these different little pieces that, that I'm given. And it's, it's, it's truly a privilege and it's been just an honor to get to work. Can we in. talk a bit about why the, why now? Yeah, so, yeah. And, and what about beauty is so important in our age? I have said before, I think to you guys, how I do not find it at all accidental that a lot of um, cultural woes we've experienced have been, because we've lost this uh, capacity to take the faith and the most exciting vision of life and imbue the culture around us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we have suffered a lot because someone else has been successful at doing that. And, you know, I, I don't think it's any accident, for example, that folks like Nietzsche or Camus or Sartre were all literature guys and they all knew how to, in a, a way that appeals to a certain sensibility, take ideas of, of, of really terrifying atheism and, um, you know, a kind of existential nihilism and just like put it into a story where you sort of feel at home. Or one of my favorite examples of like Carl Sagan, you know, his, 
he, he takes at the beginning of his uh, book, Pale Blue Dot, a few chapters for what he calls a spiritual foundation. And he, he explains through this very hazy image of the earth from the loneliness of space, how we're just enveloped in a great cosmic dark. And it sounds so attractive and he waxes poetic. And so it's, it's somebody is out there shaping our aesthetic sense. Somebody's out there teaching us what to find attractive and, and coupling that with a, with a worldview. And if we're lying down on the job, someone's gonna pick it up. And so to heal people and help them, this kind of project seems to me so timely. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's critical that we talk about how beauty heals us, mm -hmm. you know, and how it, how it heals us. And also the responsibility um, of, of the church to, to have a beautiful vision to present as well. It, it seems to me, you know, that we, um, that we have this incredible opportunity to share just the, the treasures of the faith as we, as we talk about through this series, not only the artistic tradition, but the lives of the saints um, as, as just this treasure house of, of beautiful lives and, and beautiful encounters with God mm -hmm. as well. Um, it's, yeah, it's incredible. I'm really inspired by and reminded by, and it's quite obvious, the church's commitment to mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. is all over, obviously, these episodes. And I think it, what we're called upon is to introduce people to what true beauty really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have the great luxuries that we have Leonardo, mm -hmm. we have Michelangelo, <laughs> yeah. we have. Um, but uh, beauty is not necessarily pretty. And in this day mm -hmm. and age, what's, what gets the most clicks is either sensational mm -hmm. or, um, or, or pretty, right? And we have to find a way to push past that into mm -hmm. into the real, mm -hmm. uh, something that has a real beauty and a real truth. And that's tough, but we have to do it. We've called upon to do it. That's why I'm so amazed that this was quest two, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. this is what felt so urgent about mm -hmm. it. Yes. Is um, we need to speak about this. Yeah, yeah. So the pretty is the unreal beauty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where it's, yeah, nobody looks like that in real life or, yeah. you know, how can you say that's, um, that's possible when I've seen sin, I've seen death, you know, you have to somehow give an account for reality and that a certain vision of beauty tries to get us to ignore that difficulty. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, re when we need true beauty mm -hmm. uh, is when we're in, uh, in our most pain. Mm -hmm actually we you know it when you're really depressed you need a really great depressing song is like the easy parallel but i think that we know when something's just pretty yeah. there was one i think one of the popes said you know bad art just paints mm -hmm. the ceiling into pretty pictures it doesn't pierce through into mm -hmm. the eternal yeah. and we long for it we know we long for it but it's just easier and we're just mm -hmm. called to go a little bit farther mm -hmm. a little deeper I remember one of the articles that really informed me in our interview was um, Ratzinger. So Pope Benedict, while still a cardinal, I suppose, uh, points out in uh, how Lent uh, marries two verses from Scripture that seem in opposition. There's Psalm 45, which speaks of Christ as the most handsome of men, and then Isaiah 53, which speaks about him having no majestic bearing, no beauty to draw us toward him. And so somehow the the, the one who had no beauty, uh, this Isaiah 53, suffering servant, prophecy of crucifixion, the sacred face, as we saw in episode six here, somehow that that weeping face is the most handsome of men, that that's the real canon of beauty. And that's, that's a vision of beauty that upholds, a, you know, a divine love that's, over, that's capable of overcoming every obstacle to persevere through sin and death. And if you find that beautiful, if that's what draws you forward, if that if you hope in that eternal love that can reconcile all things, um, then you're able to look into the darkness of reality and still find the possibilities of beauty. And that's the the gift of God is to, is to hold up that sacred face and say, hold on, like this is real beautiful, um, not simply a Greek sculpture of Aphrodite or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's it's so amazing too that. That's that's one of the, that's why we start in a way with the incarnation. Mm -hmm. um, mm. In this episode, uh, it it just seemed to me that we can't really understand how God meets us through the beautiful in this life, 
without understanding the incarnation first, that he would come to be one of us and he mm -hmm. would come to quite literally just dwell with us, right? And to, to just be, be one of us and to be with us and to spend time and walk through the, the, the full experience of, of human life, everything except for sin, you know, to, to just to show us that solidarity, I'm with you on the way, mm -hmm. right? Even to the very end and beyond, right? I'm, I'm with you every step of the way. Um, but that's in a way why we have to start, it seems to me, if we're gonna talk about the beautiful and what true beauty really is, that we have to start with the incarnation. We have to start with an understanding that, that, that God has in his mercy chosen to meet us where we are in a way, in the, in the body, in the senses, and that the sacraments are, are such a great example of that to me, that, mm -hmm. that they are, um, they truly are present to us in every aspect of our humanity as well as our spiritual life. So it's, it's amazing to me. I think J, uh, John Paul II's uh, letter to the artist talks about calling the artist to explore that incarnational nature of art. Mm -hmm. that that's really what you're called to do, which is a very complicated, a very difficult thing, but in some ways participates in the incarnation. Um, it's a beautiful letter. All the Pope's letters, everybody, all the Pope's letters to the artists are amazing, by the mm -hmm. way. Check them out. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. It, it's cool just to know that, right? Like you yeah. were saying, yeah. the church has always supported art. Yeah. And there's it's not just like a, a neat sideshow. Mm -hmm. It's like there is something really essential mm -hmm. about the extension of faith into art, the word becoming yeah. flesh, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's a call. It's not mm -hmm. it's not just simply, oh, art is wonderful. Yeah. Great job, you we guys. Put it's something like, on the walls. Step up. Yeah. We need you to step, step up. Yeah. up. The modern world needs Christian artists mm -hmm. to step up in a huge way right now. Um, and that and that really to me comes out in all of those. It's it's an encouragement, but it's also an exhortation in so mm -hmm. many ways to uh, I think engage. Pius the twelfth um letter is these little bullet points. And one of them, he sort of says, and by the way, good luck. <laughs> uh, this pursuit that you have chosen, the gift that you've been given, will in and of itself be a, an act of spiritual devotion mm -hmm. and be all-consuming mm -hmm. that you will call to do. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Yeah. Like that, that'll be enough is what yeah. he basically says. Yeah, um, yeah they're amazing. Well, what do you guys, I mean, uh, uh, you guys are artists, right? Like, you know, does it resonate? Does, does it feel like? Um, a consuming task, uh, mm -hmm. a fire burning within the belly. I mean, yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. In, in a way it is, a, I think it is vocational in, in mm -hmm. a way, um, not technically vocational, not like well, you know, calling, marriage, yeah. but it is, right, it, it yeah, is a yeah. calling in that way. Um, because I always think of it like you can't not do it. Um, mm. I can't not write. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you, but it's also a discipline. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Cause you have to show up. There's a great, there's a great book on artists, and they said artists are like monks, believe it or not. They said it takes the same discipline as it does to uh, right, the monastic life, the work, is the same level of focus. And you should see the parallels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. between the two. And I went, oh, you're right. And, and yeah, it's a, you, you do it for the rest of your life. You don't ever get it quite right. Um, mm. But every now and then you glimpse mm. a truth that you participate in. Um, and the world sort of stops in that moment. Mm -hmm. Time stops. That's our job. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard. It is. And thrilling. And hard and thrilling. Yeah. Shannon, talk a little bit about, I don't know what our time is like, um, process of filming. Because yeah. I don't want to lose sight of it. Because we will talk like this. We could talk like this for hours with no camera. But what you had to do when we're filming you yeah. is crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe you can speak better to that than me. Um, but I'll no, tell it's, yeah. it's it's um, it's it's really a, a, an amazing experience. So when we filmed in Rome, this was this was the big challenge for this one. Um, we set ourselves a pretty ambitious uh, goal of being able to shoot at least we, we shot roughly probably half mm -hmm. of, of the series in, in Rome. And um, so I got there about a week early and met with our film crew that was there on ground in, in Italy. And we scouted locations. We basically walked around and we said where I had a rough idea based on the themes of the episodes where I wanted to be, um, which very quickly went out the window. Um, and we had to kind of like narrow down what we wanted to do. Um, but then in the actual filming, I mean, it was incredible. My favorite, okay, the Coliseum, which, uh, 
comes up in, in uh, the episode on the lives of the saints. We had to get out there about 5.45 in the morning. We we're trying to beat the morning rush, which is not successful in Rome. It's a very, very busy city. You're in the middle of everything. And we got out there and we got in our spot. We had to move the first place we chose because there was construction going on and they were already at work, which we didn't realize. So we had to hightail all the way around the other side of the Colosseum and find a different spot. By that time, traffic starting to pick mm -hmm. up. And I decided to change what part of the script we were shooting because I did not have enough time to get the words out of my mouth before the lights changed and the traffic came past the Colosseum. Yeah. So on the fly, I was like, every short thing that I could find that made sense for where we were, that I wanted to grab there, uh, we had to make an instant pivot and just try to grab as much as we could. But that was the story, basically, of the sirens, the airplanes, the cars, the motorcycles, the um, garbage trucks. <laughs> St. Peter's. So Yeah, St. Peter's. I got there the day after this. We just happened to be in Rome at the same time. The university didn't. We, our budget isn't that they flew us to Rome. Right. <laughs> you were giving lectures. I was at a symposium. We happened to be there. We have three days. And so you can only shoot in front of St. Peter's for about eight minutes. Yeah. Because once the sun hits St. Peter's, God wins. It is so <laughs> bright that you yeah. can't actually you can't see, it. see yeah. you. And so we get out there at 530 in the morning. We're all set up. The camera's there. Shannon's ready. And we go to sh we go to film. And around the corner, it becomes a street sweeper <laughs> going, going very spray. slowly. <laughs> and you know, if you've been in front of St. Peter's, this it's just, it's a half circle. Journey. Yeah, it's yes. a long And this journey. guy is out there also yeah. spraying water. And we have to just wait. And we're watching the sun start to hit. It's like. It was so stressful. <laughs> so stressful. And then really you, was... and you would rewrite. Like, yeah. okay, I, I can only get two sentences out. In front of the catacombs, we shot. We had to, the cars are coming around the corner. We have to wait for the light to change. Yeah. And Shannon runs out and shoots two sentences and then almost gets hit by a car and runs back in. Yeah. No, yeah. it was, it's incredible. Yeah. There was a lot of that, which when we were shot. So this episode, we, we were very blessed to be on our campus, which was the most sort of uh, controlled location that we had the entire time we were there. Uh, so we did a lot of pickups on, on our campus, which was wonderful. Um, but yeah, we, even there, even there, we, we, the were, we were rewriting. Right? Yeah, we had okay. airplanes, we had other things, even the traffic going by on the road. I mean, you don't realize how noisy mm -hmm. your world is until you try to film. That's just the truth. Uh, even here on our campus in Irving, we realized that, you know, when we would try to find different locations around campus here, uh, we're, we're kind of surrounded by some highways. Um, if you've been to our campus, you know, and, and so you really hear the road noise, but you don't really notice when you're just walking around, kind of going about your day. Uh, but when you try to film it you hear everything and so it, it makes it a real challenge but yeah it was also just for the audiences it was either very very hot or very very oh, cold oh yeah That's and true too. she's she, her wardrobe is for very very hot but we shot it was very very cold but she's in the same wardrobe and you can't tell but she's shivering she's literally in a <laughs> coat take off the coat shoot two sentences and teeth chattering and then yeah it, it was crazy. Yeah, it was 95 in Rome when we shot, and it was like 30 here when we shot yeah. outside. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, that's just, that's part of the, but those are some of my favorite memories, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Like, that, it, I wouldn't trade any of those those um, those challenges that we had on, on the shoot. It just, it made it, uh, it made it something so special to, to just, to fight for it that yeah. hard, you know, and to just say, we're going to get this done. We're going to figure out how to make this happen. Um, was just a really, really special, um, a special experience. So, yeah, it was crazy. So grateful for for the team, for you, for um, Christine King, who was mm. came came to do hair. She was my personal assistant. She was basically my cheerleader. Also did hair and makeup for me, and just incredible. And then Robert and Julia, who are our team on the ground there, uh, just such. I mean, they just whatever we needed to do, they were they were there for. It was it was it was truly a spectacular um, yeah. experience. But uh, maybe as we kind of get towards the end, we could uh, take take some questions. That oh, yeah. Do we have any questions? We've, we've, uh, oh, had. oh, great. Uh, yeah. And then I want to, if we don't, I want to ask you about uh, what your ideas are for Quest 3. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. right. If we, if we yeah. have time, we will, we will talk potential future, future projects. 
So as, as we kind of wait for those, those questions to come in, uh, maybe we can come back to uh, this, this really important point, uh, Fabio, that you were saying earlier about uh, the, the holy face and, and as that new canon of beauty, which is where we end uh, this episode with sort of understanding now that we kind of have that definition, mm -hmm. now we can go forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wonder if we can kind of um, work through that for people, just how is it that that's so important for us to understand, especially in our culture today? We kind of touched on it a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Um, that that we can look at at a crucifix and we can look at at Christ and and understand truly what it is to encounter the beautiful. Yeah, I, I suspect that um, one of the things about beauty that will tell us it's real is when we're struck by it and when we're really captivated and mm. we're just standing really in awe. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's nothing really in this world that is really capable to capture us for eternity, except we hope this love that knows no limit. And that is enough to keep us moving forward, I believe. Um, okay, so we have a question uh, from Dan who says, can you comment on the wide spectrum of beauty? Roger Scruton talks about judging beauty, human and natural beauty, everyday beauty versus artistic beauty, taste, mm -hmm. order. How do we define such a wide concept? So we're, we're sort of dealing, I guess, with, um, in a way, sort of like the range, right? The mm -hmm. range by what we mean. And, and in a way, that's kind of what we end up doing mm -hmm. uh, in the series is trying to hit some of those. So I wonder... Um, any thoughts about about that? I, how we I wish it? I knew Roger Scruton's work more. It's definitely all high on my list of, of things to do. But I suspect one way to tackle that question would be to point out, one, how beauty will be mediated to us through our corporality and therefore through the diversity of our senses. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's going to hit home uh, through different mediums. But there's always going to be something characteristic of them all. You know, the, the unity, the symmetry, the proportion, mm -hmm. the claritas for the medievals. And so I think that uh, wherever it's coming from, whether it's, you know, an oral, an oral beauty through poetry or beauty of something seen, uh, you're going to expect uh, a unity, um, a symmetry, a clarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I love that when we start talking about uh, Aquinas, I think, mm -hmm. is kind of gives us yeah. that language to talk mm -hmm. about beauty. And so I always think of... Um, like the, the rose windows, you know, stained glass mm -hmm. rose windows um, as in a way kind of being illustrative of, of all three of those, right? That sort of, there's uh, there's a, a light about what is truly beautiful. Even if we're talking about the dark things, there's something illuminating, yeah. right, it, one about of it. The, I think it's Benedict talks about how Plato says beauty should bring us up short, mm -hmm. mm. give us a little shock, sort of grab us and break open, pierce into the infinite, right? And so what is that? And I always think of um, if you've eaten something so beautiful, just what taste can sometimes do, is it kind of just stop you, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you go, whoa, that is complicated. It's not always soothing, right? Yeah. True beauty is one that mm -hmm. brings us up short and kind of makes us feel more human mm -hmm. by participating in the divine. Now, um, a great view does that. I just think about things that are truly beautiful. Mm -hmm. They often have great human questions in them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's where it is. Yeah. And there's just yeah. so many images of that out there. It's quite complicated. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I imagine a good way to kind of synthesize this is like Mother Teresa, you know? Yeah. Like there is something very difficult about calling her beauty if your canon of beauty is, I don't know, you know, yeah. some yeah. wonderful celebrity or something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But then if you see her helping a leper whose body is torn, you can see, okay, there is some kind of proportion here. Like this mm. act is somehow reconciling disease and neglect. And somehow this moment has been redeemed because here is a human heart that is like affirming the dignity of the other person in a way that, you know, somebody could have waited 70 years of their life yeah. of being ignored to be treated in such a way. Uh, I think that that's when you know beauty strikes you when you can mm -hmm. when you can mm -hmm. see a leper on the street and an old woman bent over loving and you can be paused and be like wow why am i not doing that that's yeah. where you get yeah. you know shocked up and it's like well who am i and yeah. should i move forward and 
I'm yeah. longing now for that as well. I'm not content to just yeah. stand outside the painting. Yeah. I mm -hmm. want to be drawn into it. Yeah, no, it's, it's almost like it issues that challenge. We were talking earlier mm -hmm. about the exhortation in a way to, to the artist, but I think in, in a, beauty is in a way an exhortation to humanity, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that call of love in the face of the brokenness of, of this world. And mm -hmm. that truly is what speaks. Love speaks to the heart, mm -hmm. right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's really what. Even the great moment of suffering yeah. reveal the dignity of the human yeah. because they can suffer, mm -hmm. right? And that is actually life-giving to even witness and see like, oh, that is possible. Is there one, um, one other question? We'll talk about this yes, for, yes. forever. Yes, let's see. Um, oh, let's see. Maybe. Maybe there. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe, Maybe not. Um, yeah. yeah, so we can, yeah. we can just, mm -hmm. um, well, but yeah, yeah. That beauty, that image, I, I work on it all the time as a, I'm a theater director by trade. So I'm always creating something that is both a connection of um, sound and lights and the human mm -hmm. and words. Mm -hmm. And what makes it better than normal is when it's complicated, mm -hmm. when it is not shallow. That deep connection to a truth is one way I know, oh, we're onto something. Mm -hmm. We're onto something, right? Well, can I say too, um, some of the most powerful moments that I've I've found in in theater um, are are the moments where no one's speaking. There's a look, right? Mm -hmm. There's and and you feel like you are a part of something that's happening that you know you don't really mm -hmm. fully understand what's going on, perhaps, yeah. but you're drawn in and it's mm -hmm. arresting, right? It's that moment of just being completely. Um, drawn in and and stopped in in that moment and mm -hmm. and you hold your breath you know like yeah. you yeah. really if it's really done well you are there with the care and it's this moment of just suspension you know that's it that's the best thing i can think of to it's explain drawn that. in suspended i love those as images for the experience of beauty because i think when you experience beauty you are humbled and mm -hmm. you are yeah. wanting mm -hmm. more um, I, I, I suspect this is a great way to line the transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness together. Like if you think you know the truth so well that you've got it in your back pocket and you're no longer marveling, you've yeah. missed it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when you recognize so that the transcendentals yeah. are, are aligned on each other mm -hmm. and the truth is beautiful and you've got it in some sense, but it's pulling you forward. Yeah. 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 You're suspended. Like you, you don't have it autonomously. Like you are holding it in a kind of faith. Yeah. It's drawing you upward and further. Now you're starting to see the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's that's my favorite. So C.S. Lewis, we end uh, the very last episode with um, C.S. Lewis's last battle and the experience of the four children finally um, entering into, um, they enter into Aslan's country. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they realize that they are going to always be drawn further up and further in to mm -hmm. the beauty that is, is waiting for them, right? And C.S. Lewis, just, he, he plants that in, in uh, very early on in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, this idea that we go further up and further in to meet Aslan. Mm -hmm. And it's just the continuation of that image. But now in Aslan's country, there's there's no end. There's no, there's no grief. There's no sorrow. There's no separation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that would keep them from continuing on mm -hmm. the journey. So that's why we say it's, yes, it's, it's the end, but it's also the beginning. The way yeah. of beauty doesn't actually end. Uh, it just it just continues to draw us further into that inexhaustible truth and goodness yeah. that is God. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. It's going to yeah. be great. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yes. Yes. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see how everyone responds to the second one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I wish we had time for you to talk about the third one, but I think we're almost out of time. Yeah. 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 I might just say, Think about the journey of, of faith and the sacraments and how that is also a quest. That is awesome. Thank you all for joining Thank us. Thank you, guys. Have a great night.